right. It's good to be here. Amen? Week seven. I can't even believe it. Just to give you a um, reminder, um, next week we will conclude the 12 steps. Um, and then we're going to take a break the following week for um, the election. And uh, there is a commercial bef- the day before the election on Monday. We'll be having a worship night here. So make sure you put that on your calendar. That'll be a good time. We're going to seek the Lord and prayer. I think it's at six, but I'm not sure. Six or seven. Um, but uh, I want to encourage everybody to come to that prayer night and worship night. That's really important, right? It's also very important to what we're doing with spiritual warfare because we're going to come together and be praying on behalf of the church and the nation. So make sure that you put that on your calendar to come. And then we'll pick up two extra weeks. And I haven't even decided 100% where I'm going then. But uh, we'll do a little review. But I, I may... I thought about maybe giving you some tools on witnessing to cults, like Mormons and Jehovah's Witnesses and things like that. Or, yeah, so we may do that. May we may do a wrap up and then like, how do we witness to Mormons or something? Oh, that's good apologetic, right? Yeah. So anyway, tonight we're covering the next two points of the twelve classical points of apologetics. Woohoo! Um, huh? Yeah, I'm excited. Man, you guys are so lame. I'm excited. <laughs> okay. You're not lame, though. I was, jo- I was joking. You're really not lame. You're awesome. But that was lame. Um, okay, so let's see. They, they can't, the thing about when we do a recording is they can't hear you, so I have to repeat what you say. So if I repeat what you say, it's not because I'm being a, mock- a mocking bird. But I'm, so let's go through the 12 points. Let's, let's, go, let's go for the first the first six. Don't look. Don't look. Everybody starts looking down. Let's just throw them out there. Let's just see if we get them. You know, what's the first one? The truth about reality is knowable. The truth about reality is knowable. That's good. The next one. The opposite of truth is false. Now it starts to get a little bit more challenging. What's the next one? The yes, a theistic God exists. Right. It is true that a theistic God exists, and then. The good, the good thing about that one is once you have that, then what's automatic, which is the next one? Miracles. Then miracles are possible, right? And then what do miracles do? Confirm a truth claim, right? right. Miracles uh, that accompany a truth claim confirm the truth claim, right? Which, which is we're setting the stage for where we're going. And then last week we covered what? The New Testament is reliable. And so finally... Like this whole time, I've not been able to say to people at work, hey, we're having a Bible study tonight because it wasn't a Bible study. It was a general revelation study. But tonight I actually get to say we're having a Bible study because we established last week that the Bible, the New Testament is reliable. So we're going to look all into the New Testament today. Now, there is a lot of notes and I may not even get through them all, but you're going to get them because you're going to get a download and it's going to be awesome. And uh, then you need to learn them, right? You don't need to learn all of them because there's a lot of scriptures. Um, But what you do need to know, and I would recommend, is on a few of the categories that we're going to talk about, you want to memorize at least, if you don't memorize the scripture, at least know the reference. So if you're talking to someone, you could open a Bible and you could bring them to those passages. Because the points that we're going to be covering, the next two points, the first one is, as witness in the New Testament, Jesus claimed to be God. And then the next one is, Jesus' claim to be God was proven by, and yeah, unique convergence of miracles. Right, absolutely. See how we set the stage early so that we say, yes, that's how we know. So it wasn't just that, the, well, it was the eyewitnesses that talked about him, but then his miracles confirmed it, right? And so we're going to jump into the first one. I want to say this before we, well, I'll say it in a minute. So let's look at the first syllogism for Jesus claimed to be God, right? And, uh, and I will tell you that he did, okay? So I say that because... They're going to hear that a lot of people think he didn't. So here's premise one. If the New Testament accurately, accurately records Jesus' statements, and those statements include claims of, to divinity, then Jesus claimed to be God. That's, if that premise is true, then, then premise two, we have to see if it's true. The New Testament accurately records Jesus making direct and indirect claims to divinity. Conclusion, therefore, Jesus claimed to be God. So we have to make sure that these are the premises. Last week, we established that the New Testament is reliable. So now looking at the New Testament, which is an eyewitness testament, right, by, by, by people who either were direct 
uh, eyewitnesses of Jesus, um, or they were disciple. They were under disciples of a direct eyewitnesses of Jesus. But I, I would, I would even step out on a limb and say that all of the New Testament writers probably were eyewitnesses of Jesus in some regard. Maybe not directly one of his like math. Luke was not a disciple, an apostle, but he was a disciple. And I can't hardly figure out how Jesus could have been traveling around Palestine for three and a half years and maybe they didn't see him, but it's possible. But at any rate, these are people who were eyewitnesses, right? And so many people today are comfortable with seeing Jesus as just a good moral teacher or a wise prophet. You'll often hear people say, I like Jesus, but I don't think he was God. But the problem is Jesus didn't leave that option open. Um, if we truly look at the word of God and the actions that are, that are um, recorded there, we see that he claimed to be much more than just a moral teacher. He claimed to be God. Now, this is important, and I'll tell you who, who, who probably it's, it's the most important to. It's, it's important to just people generally who are seekers. But does anyone know which religions, just off the top of your head, that it would be really good when you're talking to them about Jesus' truth claims? Because they believe in Jesus, but they don't necessarily believe that he was God. Who? Jehovah's Witnesses. Jehovah's Witnesses believe Jesus was an angel. And so using these scriptures is really good to witness to Jehovah's Witnesses. So I'm giving you a little, a little tilt there for a couple of weeks from now when we talk about ministering to Jehovah's Witnesses. It's good to learn these uh, some passages. Who else? Muslims. Muslims believe Jesus was a prophet, but they don't believe he was God. And so they'll even say he never claimed to be God. I don't know if you know this. I know, actually, I have to take the time to get this, the, the passage in the Koran. But the Koran actually says the, the Bible is accurate and attests to the truth of it. Did you know that? You can actually use the Bible when you witness to Muslims. And if they say you can't, you got to know, we all got to come up, we all got to memorize this verse in the Koran. Because once you have it, you can say, yeah, your Bible talks about the Holy Book. And it's Hey, Jesus is mentioned. And hey, by the way, look what Jesus says of himself and look what happened. And that's what we're going to cover tonight, okay? So we're going to look at first, the first section is Jesus' direct claims to be God. Directly from his mouth, things he said that we go, yes. The first one, and I'm going to, like I said, I have, there's a, just a ton. You can see we're going to go through a ton of verses. So just, you don't have to write them all down. You're going to have your own copy, but if you'll listen for sure. And, but if you're a person who likes to learn by writing things down, then by all means, write them down. But Jesus in, in John 8, 58 said, before Abraham was, I am, right? Now, he didn't say before Abraham was, I was. He says, I am, which, which to somebody who is in America would look at that and go, who doesn't have a, a background say, that's just some bad grammar, right? Before Abraham was, I am. But Jesus uses the, a divine name, I am, directly identifying himself with God's self-revelation that comes in Exodus chapter 3, where he calls himself the I am. That's where we get the word Yahweh. Yahweh means I am, if you didn't know that. <laughs> Maybe you did, but now you know it for sure. So he called himself. Now, he didn't say Yahweh because he was speaking most likely in Aramaic or Greek. So he probably said, um, he probably gave, uh, I, mean, I actually know the word and I'm, I'm, having, I'm having a brain. Down. Oh, he said, uh, ego eimi, which means I am in Greek, right? And so before Abraham was, I am. But this right here, and I'll tell you why. People will say, well, he just said that. But that doesn't, maybe it was just a, a misprint, right? Well, in the context, if you read the context, he's clearly talking to the Jews about his designation before Abraham, right? And here's how you know that. The following passage says that they picked up stones to stone him. Now, if he was just saying, hey, before Abraham, you know, I, I might have been around uh, as some kind of cool thing, they wouldn't have stoned him because they were stoning him for blasphemy. They were stoning him for his claim to be God, that someone could exist before Abraham that is standing here talking to me today. No other person would be able to make a claim like that, right? There's no timeless person who can live that long. Let's move on. John chapter 10, verse 3. He said, I, John 10, 30, and the Father are one. Now, I will say this. I didn't make any slides today. And I contacted my wife in the desert at the end of the day, and I said, could you make some slides? Because she had some free time. And so she did not 
do all the slides. I think she fell asleep doing the slides. So some of the slides are there, some slides are not. I don't know. She never told me. She probably was like, oh my gosh, I'm not doing all these slides. So some slides are going to show up. So if you think I'm missing slides, it's not me. Rhonda's missing slides, okay? <laughs> there would have been no slides, though, so thank God for Rhonda. She'll probably watch this and want to stone me, too. John chapter 10, verse 30, he says this, I and the Father are one. I and the Father are one. Jesus claims unity with the Father. His Jewish audience understood this claim to be deity, accusing him of blasphemy. And guess what? They wanted to stone him. Okay? If you said to somebody who happens to be Muslim, why would Jesus say, before Abraham was, I am, and I and the Father are one? Because th what they're saying is he didn't, he didn't say, well, I'm God. But that doesn't mean that. We're looking at evidence based on what he said. You know, I think Jesus a lot of times, I mean, he knew at that, on that particular day when he said this phrase, he knew Rob Miskowski, and he knew I'd be talking about it today because he knows all things. He knew that people today would be arguing about it. But he also oftentimes talked in parables, and he said, those who have ears to hear can hear. And I think a lot of times we have to, it's not always as clear, but if you study, you say, wow, he said, I and the Father are one. That's pretty powerful. John chapter 14, verse 9 says, Anyone who has seen me has seen the Father. Okay, Jesus asserts that seeing him is equivalent to seeing the Father. That's powerful, indicating his divine identity. John chapter 5. Like I said, we're just going through passages, but we want to get it in our heads. John chapter 5, verse 17 and 18. My Father is always at work to this very day, and I, too, am working. Jesus' references to God as my Father. Now, today, we miss this. Because when Jesus is also called the Son of God, we think of it just like, what's the big deal? There's lots of people call themselves Son. But it, was, it meant equal to God, not Son like we just think of Son. And calling him your Father, they wouldn't have called him Father in that regard. So they immediately got what he was saying. Oh, you're direct Father? This is a relationship that, that we don't have, right? Um, and so they understood his claim was, was with equality for God. So re, further reinforcing his assertion that he worked as God did. Mark chapter 14, verse 61 and 62, he says, I am, you, and you will see the Son of Man sitting at the right hand of the Mighty One and coming down on the clouds of heaven. So Jesus explicitly affirms his identity as the divine son of man, which also comes, shows up in Daniel chapter 7. So he talks about himself being a fulfillment of G Daniel chapter 7, which the Jews would have understood, especially the religious leaders, that he's coming. He is, he's the one who is the son of man sitting at the right hand of father. That's a special place showing divinity here and coming back on the clouds of glory which would be, for us, we understand, is that second coming, right? Are you getting it? Clear, decisive. People are like, well, Jesus never claimed to be God. Yes, he did, a lot of times. Um, Matthew chapter 28, verse 18, he said this. Think about this phrase. All authority in heaven and on earth have been given to me. Now you say, okay, well, just ask. You can ask the question. What do you think that means? <laughs> what does it mean? All authority in heaven and on earth, I mean, basically all authority has been given to me. Well, how can a man who is just a misguided zealot who's, you know, showed up on the scene for a season have all authority? He wasn't that, right? So Jesus' claim was a universal authority claim over both heaven and earth, which only God can possess. John chapter 17, verse 5. And now, Father, he's praying, glorify me in your presence with the glory I had with you before the world began. Wow. Before the world began? Think about, I want you to think about this. Well, I'm gonna, I actually, I always get ahead. I'm jumping ahead. So you think about thinking about that, okay? And we'll come back to it. In John chapter 14, verse 6, he said, I am, there's that again, the ego a me, the way, the truth, and the life. I mean, you can't get much more greater and bigger than that. 
I am the way. I am the truth. We're so used to just saying it because we've learned Christianese over the years that we just do it all the time. But when we bring that, these claims before someone who's investigating the Bible and you look at him, you go, wow, these are pretty big claims. He's the way. He is the way? Yeah, he's the way. He's the truth? Yeah, he is. He is, he's not, doesn't just have truth. He is truth. And he doesn't just have life. He is life. That's, you can't get any bigger. In other words, what? Remember, we go back to our beginning. We, he is the unmoved mover. He's the uncaused cause. He's the, the thing who started it all. And so we see this amazing. It's amazing to me that 2,000 years ago, we have these passages of Scripture that have survived, and they're here, and we can read about them. And, he's, and it's just, wow, you know, and science starts uncovering things like the Big Bang and how it started, and we go, wow. Yeah, I know that one who says, I, I'm the way, the truth, and the life, because he started that. And we don't know how the Big Bang started. We just think it started somehow. Well, I know, because I can go all the way back to the first century and look at this verse, you know? I don't know. I get excited about it. Revelation chapter 1, verse 8. Now, this would, be, um, it was, this would be a part of a vision that John received, but in it, his vision, he saw Jesus talking, and he said, I am the Alpha and the Omega, who is and who was and who is to come, the Almighty. So Jesus claims the titles of eternal God, Alpha and Omega. That means everything. That means beginning and end. That's what it means. That's Aleph and I think it's Omicron, maybe. But I think it's the, the, the Greek alphabet, right? And so Jesus claimed to be God. What did Jesus claim? Yeah, he claimed it. It wasn't a, it wasn't a well, I don't know. Right from the horse's mouth, right? That's what they call it, right? Right from his lips, he said it. Let's move on to the next point. Jesus is saying and doing, Jesus said and did only what God can, can do and say, right? Let me see some things. Now, the ones we looked at just a minute ago were just clear declaration statements about who he was because of the abilities that he had in that. These are things he said that only God would be able to say. The first one was he forgave sins, okay? In Mark chapter 2, Jesus forgives the paralytic sins. He says, your sins are forgiven. And, um, and Jewish leaders react by saying, who can forgive sins but God alone? You get it? He was like, it was a veiled reference to say, yeah, <laughs> you're right. And then what does he do? He forgives the sins and he, he heals the paralytic, right? He does both. Uh, another time in Luke chapter 7, verse 48, 49, Jesus tells a sinful woman, your sins are forgiven. Again, onlookers question his authority to forgive sins. These weren't done in a vacuum. These were done where other people heard him say it. Folks, when someone says to me, I don't think Jesus claimed to be God, I say, well, can you tell me why he was crucified? I mean, tell me why. Like, why was he nailed to a cross? Why was he put on trial? For blasphemy, for claiming to be God. That was what it was. It wasn't just like, oh, we just want to crucify somebody. Claiming, he also claimed to be the judge of humanity. In John chapter 5, verse 22 and through 27, Jesus claims the divine prerogative to judge all of humanity, a role that only the God in the Old Testament could do. In Matthew chapter 25, in the parable of the sheep and the goats, what does he say? He will separate the sheep from the goats and he will be the judge. Again, who does judging? Who can judge all of it? Can Jesus, if he's just a man, judge anybody or judge any, any uh, world in the future? No. Raising the dead by his own authority. In John chapter 11, Jesus said, I am the resurrection and the life. Demonstrating divine power over life and death. Somebody taught me something when I was in seminary early on that I think we need to, it's always good to remind ourselves of. When you read the Bible, like when you get up and do your devotional, if you would try to get in a habit of saying, I'd like to look at this as if it's the very first time I'm seeing it. Because we, we need to have fresh eyes. Because like I said, sometimes we get used to these phrases because we've heard them so many times. You want to imagine yourself as the original recipient of the word that's reading this for the first time. I am the resurrection and the life. Wow, God, I don't ever want to just gloss over that <laughs> because 
you personify my future and my hope in the resurrection, right? So these are things that we should be thinking about and focusing on. So I think that's just a good free candy for you. Um, he accepted worship, which would be blasphemy if he wasn't God, right? After walking on water, his disciples worship him, and he doesn't refuse the worship, okay? John chapter, as Matthew 14. John chapter 9, after healing a blind man, the man worships him, and he does not reject the worship. He doesn't say, no, 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 no. Which, by the way, if we go into the, the apostles, I, uh, Paul, and I can't remember who his traveling companion was, they thought they were uh, Hermes and Mercury, I think, and they threw garlands on them and started worship, and they were like, get up. <laughs> well, we're not that, you know. It's like, that actually happened to me when I went to India. They worship everything in India. Someone came up and put these little things over me and fell down and started worshiping me. I didn't know what was happening. I was like, what's happening right now? And my guide said, get up, get, up, get out of here, you know. But they'll, they'll, people will worship whatever, right? But what I'm saying is Jesus accepted the worship because he's worthy of the worship. You get it? He claimed authority of the Sabbath. Jesus declared himself the Lord of the Sabbath, which is amazing. I mean, he was breaking the Sabbath, and he constantly was, they were saying, oh, you're breaking the Sabbath. He's like, I'm the Lord of the Sabbath. You know, I'm, the Sabbath was made for me, man, not man for the Sabbath, and you're missing it. Because I'm the one, think about, I just, again, if you go to, if you go to that first time, um, looking at the Bible for the very first time mentality, or you take that kind of thought pattern, and you see Jesus, and you think about, this is the God who made all the people that he's walking with. <laughs> and he made the law that they're trying to hang on him. And he, and, and, and you know what I'm saying? And he walked into the temple that they built because of a blueprint that he gave on the mountain, on Mount Sinai, for the tabernacle that was then turned into a temple. And there, he's walking among them in it. I mean, it just boggles my mind. I mean, I don't know. I get excited about that stuff. Isn't it? One person got excited with me. <laughs> John chapter 8, verse 58, Jesus uses the divine name again. I am aligning himself with God. I got talked about that one. but um, He could control nature. Now we're gonna, I'm not going to go there because <clears throat> we're, that's actually in the next section. I, I, I had to bleed over a little bit. He claimed to be the source of eternal life. <clears throat> John chapter 6, verse 35, Jesus claims to be the bread of life that came down from heaven and is a source of eternal satisfaction. He says, what? If you, if, you, if you eat this stuff, you'll never hunger, right? If you have this, this is a, satisfac this is a satisfier of satisfiers, right? And so he also, um, Jesus claimed the power to give eternal life, which is a power reserved for God alone, he claimed pre-existence. Jesus speaks of the glory he shared with the Father before creation in John chapter 17. Uh, he claimed to fulfill the law and the prophets. <laughs> That's, wow, I, I came to fulfill the law and the prophets, right? Um, a role that only a Messiah could do. It's only God could do that. He claimed authority to send the Holy Spirit. He sent the Holy Spirit. He said, I will pray to the Father and he will send the Spirit to you, right? So these are things he did that only God could do. Do you getting it? So these are things he said that only God would say, and these are things he did that gave credence to his, his, his uh, testimony. And then there are three direct quotes. Uh, there, are, there are not three. It's point three. There are direct quotes of other individuals, and this is always good. And I, and I actually, I, I, that's why I was going to pause earlier when I said I'll get to this. That these were none of these things, these sayings were done in a vacuum. And the reason I'm telling you that is when Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, and, and Luke again in the book of Acts recorded these things, hordes of people could have said, uh, no, he didn't say that. Uh, we're, not, we're, not, we're not accepting that. But there was multitudes of people that followed him often when he was giving these teachings. And they would have told their kids and their friends and their neighbors, and they would have wrote it down, and they would have, and it would have been. So there was record everywhere of these statements. These weren't just done in a vacuum where he's in a small room saying, hey, let me tell you, I'm the way, the truth, and the life. Don't tell anyone, right? And so here's some direct ones, okay? John chapter 1, this is, this is 
a person who followed Jesus, John, who is his apostle, he writes in John chapter 1, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. And when he continues through that, we know the word logos, which is the word for word in Greek, is referring to Jesus, right? John describes Jesus as the eternal word who was with God and was God, which, by the way, we'll pause and say another good verse for Jehovah's Witnesses, by the way. Although, unfortunately, they tore that, that out of their Bible. They have the New World Translation, and in that translation, they say in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was a God. They put a definite article in front of it, which is not there in the original Greek, which, yes. So anyway, that's just bad. Okay, I'm giving, I don't even have to do a teaching on Jehovah's Witnesses because we've covered them tonight. Let's move on. John chapter 20, uh, we hear this. My Lord and my God. Who said it? Do you guys remember? Thomas. After he touched him, after he saw him, he claimed, my Lord and my God. He didn't say, oh, my God, you are. No, he said, my God. Are you with me? He called him it. John chapter 20, verse 28. I mean, yeah, that's another one. Jesus shows up in a, in a room, right? And he breathes on people. <laughs> Receive the Holy Ghost. <laughs> yeah, that's powerful, too. John chap I'm sorry, Colossians chapter 2, another direct quote. He says this, Paul, for in Christ all the fullness of the deity lives in bodily form. For in Christ all the fullness of deity lives in bodily form. Talk about a testimony of, I wonder if he's God or not. Well, Paul said all the deity <laughs> exists in, Paul, in Jesus in bodily form. That's pretty, pretty powerful, right? affirming that the full nature of God dwells bodily in Jesus and he is divine. That is a great verse also for your friends who believe he was an angel. Okay, Titus chapter 2, verse 13, direct quote, While we wait for the blessed hope, the appearing of and glory of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. We're waiting for an appearing of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, right? Not our Lord and Savior and Jesus Christ. Our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, okay? And so that, we again, I want to remind you, we're used to hearing these passages, but we're going to use them because not everyone's used to them, okay, when we're making a case for Christ. And so Paul calls Jesus our God, our great God and Savior. This is another really good one. Uh, they're all good. But Hebrews 1.8 says, your throne, O God, is forever and ever. It actually says, God says of Jesus, your throne, O God. The Father says of Jesus, of the Son, your throne, O God, will last forever and ever. And, and, and Paul is arguing in that, and you, you have to look at it all in context, that that shows us, he's talking to the Hebrews, he's saying that shows the evidence, because God said to the Son, your throne, O God. So that's why... That's a good Trinitarian. If someone's saying, well, you know, we have the Father, the Son. He's the Son. He's not God. Your throne, O God, will last forever and ever. He calls him God, okay? He's definitely God. That's where people get confused. Well, is he, is he the Son or is he God? Yes. Yes. And it's confusing sometimes because Christians, to be fair, were the ones who caused the confusion. Because we'll say stuff about Jesus and then we'll say something about God. But Jesus is God. We don't want to differentiate. So if you're going to use that, say Jesus and the Father. Don't say Jesus and God because it confuses people. Does that make sense? If you're talking about Jesus praying to, to God, have him praying to the Father because he's God, right? Does that, that make sense? Because sometimes we're the ones who create the problem, right? It's a sidebar, but the same with the Holy Ghost. People, people get so confused about the Holy Ghost, you know. I, I heard people say to me, you got the Holy Ghost? And what they mean is, do you have the power of the Holy Spirit? But they confuse it because everyone who's a Christian has the Holy Spirit. But not everybody has the power of the Holy Spirit. Ah, another whole other sermon. But. Yeah, or class. So Philippians chapter 2, verses 5 through 6, another direct quote. Jesus Christ, who being in very nature God did not consider equality with God something to be grasped, 
right? What's that say? Jesus Christ, who being in very nature, God, right? Paul emphasizes his divine nature. 1 Peter 1.1, 1, 1, through the righteousness of our God and Savior, Jesus Christ. There you go. Gave him a title. Romans chapter 9, Christ, who is God over all, forever praised, amen. Christ, over all, Jesus over all, forever praised. That's, if that's not God, I don't know who he is. Because he certainly, if he's a man, isn't over all, and I'm not going to praise him. But he is who he said he is, all right? Are you with me? Is this good stuff? These are good verses. It's good to get verses that we know. If you just picked a few of them, you know, pick your favorites. And, uh, and then just, just, just learn them and, and keep using them. Just say, yeah, oh, yeah, he did say he was God. Let me show you a couple of them. And then, um, you know, sometimes people will try to have rebuttals for this stuff, but sometimes that's why you keep giving them more. <laughs> keep giving them more, you know. Obviously, don't overwhelm them because we always want to give apologetics light. We don't want to give them the whole hammer. But if they want to talk about it, you say, well, yeah, here's some, a couple more verses. Okay, so you with me? He claimed to be God. Okay. And other people claim to be God for him, right? Let's move on. So uh, point two. So in point two, we are talking about Jesus' claim to be God was proven by miracles. And so the syllogism we're going to look at, um, premise one is, if Jesus performed miracles that only God could perform, his claims to divinity are validated. Premise two, the New Testament documents numerous miracles performed by Jesus that fulfill prophecy, demonstrate divine power, and are attested by multiple witnesses. And that's always a good one, right? Because, you know, the multiple witnesses it stands up in a court of law, right? Even in that day. And so, so the conclusion is Jesus' miracles validate his claims to be God. And remember, this, this builds off what we talked about a couple weeks ago where Miracles done with a truth claim, we're, gonna, we're going there. You get it? Because next week we're going to talk about his truth claims because he's doing miracles. Okay? You getting me? You with me? You feeling me? Miracles weren't just acts of kindness that Jesus performed. They were so much more than that, guys. They were signs. And when you think of the word signs, what do signs mean? What does a sign do? Points me somewhere. Exactly. These were signs pointed to his divinity. That's why they're called signs. Um, powerful demonstrations that point to who he is. Who is he? God in the flesh. These miraculous events weren't random. They weren't for show. They served a very specific perfect purpose to authenticate his claims to be God. Every miracle he performed was intentional, fulfilled prophecy, left lasting impact on everyone who witnessed them. And so the evidence was undeniable. He wasn't just a teacher or a prophet. He was God walking among the people. Okay. Interesting sidebar. I think I said this a few weeks ago. There is no recorded miracles from Muhammad. Isn't that interesting? Because they'll say Muhammad was a greater prophet than Jesus, which is amazing. Miracles are signs of divine identity. So in the Gospel of John, the word used to describe miracles is this word signs. That's where you see it. You'll see it in John chapter 2, John chapter 4. And that word is important because it, it points to the mir uh, beyond the miracle, and which is what we want to do. Because again, when he did something, you have to say, okay, what, what is he, what's going on here? You know, he's, he's doing it in conjunction with things, right? The very first one, for example, he did in conjunction with the start of his ministry. Turning water into wine at Cana. He didn't do that just to keep the wedding party going. The miracle was the first sign of his glory, and the disciples believed in him. Now, it was prodded by his mother, and, it was, and things moved forward, but he even knew from eternity that his mom would prod him, folks. You get that one, right? And he knew how it was going to go. He said, this is who I am. Pay attention to me, basically, right? <laughs> I'm getting ready to do something. And he, he launched his public ministry with that miracle at Canaan. Uh, they're also very public proof. Um, something we can't overlook is that these miracles weren't done secretly. They were done in public, witnessed by crowds. For example, the feeding of the 5,000. Do you know how many were at the feeding of 5,000? 
more than 5,000 because he only counted men. So he called the women and children. It was probably a feeding of 15,000 or something. I mean, it could be, it was a lot. I don't know how many, but it was definitely a bunch of people. I don't know if you think about it, but think about like uh, um, the, the hockey stadium being filled with people. That's, that's who he was feeding on just a day, right? It's a pretty big deal, right? And so those people are like, wow, didn't this, wasn't this basket just empty? <laughs> it seemed like every time I reach in there, there's more bread. I, man, I, don't you guys want to be there and see that? I'm like, I really want to know how that, I want to be looking in the basket and seeing, as, are, they just, are they just popping up? Is it, what's happening? I want to know what's happening in that basket, don't you? I wonder if they held it up and were like, don't look in the basket. We're just going to, I don't know, it's just a sidebar. <laughs> but I would, I would totally want to be there. If these events didn't really happen, there would have been plenty of people to deny them, refute them, especially ones that had 10,000 people there, you know. Think also about the resurrection of Lazarus, John chapter 11. This, this is a big one, guys. You know, this is before Jesus raises himself, but he's raising other people. This miracle wasn't private. It happened in front of mourners. It happened in front of skeptics. Uh, Lazarus had been dead for four days. You know, they had already put him in a tomb. There's a bunch of people involved in that whole thing of wrapping him up and putting him in there. He was stinking. And when Jesus raised him from the dead, it wasn't just a powerful display of his authority over death. It was, an un, it was so undeniable that the religious leaders who hated Jesus had to acknowledge it. And guess what? They then tried to kill, I told you this, I think, last week. They tried to kill the guy that Jesus raised. It's like, wow, man, that's a bad life right there. In fact, it caused that much stir. They couldn't refute it. So they tried to destroy the evidence. That's what they were trying to do. Okay, what about power over nature? Demonstrating divine authority. Let's talk about Jesus' control over nature. This, this is a big one, too. I mean, we just overlook these things, right? Uh, it wasn't just flashy miracles. This was a direct demonstration of his authority over creation itself. One of the most famous examples is when he walks on water and he calms the storm in the same text. Walking on water would have been enough. Calming the storm would have been enough. You know, peace be still. But walking on the water and then calming the storm, you're like, wow, something. You know, these guys really thought they were going to drown. I don't know if you've ever been on a boat. I've been there. I thought I was going to drown once. I was on Lake Pontchartrain. It was the most terrifying time I've ever been on a boat. And it was freezing out, and it was wind was blowing, and I, we ran ashore. And I'm just telling you, if, if all of a sudden out of nowhere that thing just went calm, when somebody said, peace be still, I'd be paying attention. And, and it, took the, it took the fear out of everybody. God, isn't that something? He's showing us that he has the same authority as God because he is God. And the disciples' response, they didn't just stand in awe, they worshipped. That calming was so powerful that they couldn't help but worship him. Are you getting it? Only God can have that kind of authority over nature. Power over life and death. Now, there are lots of, lots of more. There's just some we chose out from the Bible. And by we, I'm talking about me, Norman Geisler, who wrote, <laughs> uh, who wrote 12 points of uh, that the proved that the world... 12 points to prove that Jesus exists. Also, I want to recommend a couple other books. That There's a guy named um, Gary Habermas. All his books on the resurrection. If you want to read some really good stuff, he's the best on the resurrection, probably scholar today. I mean, the books are like this thick, and it's like it's a lot of deep reading, but uh, evidence for the resurrection, which we're going to talk about in just a minute. But also, I took some from Evidence That Demands a Verdict. Also a great book. It's, it's been redone. It's called More Evidence That Demands a Verdict now because his son, Sean McDowell, has now joined him as an apologist. So it's Josh and and Sean, which is pretty cool. And, they, and Sean has a podcast as well, if you want to watch, look it up. So anyway, power over life and death, proving Jesus' divine identity. Now, if we're talking about Jesus' divine authority, nothing shows this more than Lazarus, right? Um, but, but we're going to talk about the fact that he also claimed, he, remember he said, I'm the resurrection and the life. He didn't just claim he could raise Lazarus from the dead. He actually raised Lazarus from the dead. So what you want to do when you talk about that is you want to talk about his claim followed by his, he, he put his money where his mouth was, right? He did what he said he could do. It'd be something if he just said, I'm the resurrection and life. Oh, yeah? But then after that, then it was a fulfillment of what he said. Are you with me? Um, he's also a fulfillment of messianic prophecies, miracles as proof of Jesus as the Messiah. 
which, is, which for them is what they were looking for. At the time, we've got to remember, first century Palestine, they, had, they were hating the Romans who were oppressing them and taxing them to death and, 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 and had come and occupied their land and they wanted to get rid of them. And so their idea of a Messiah was somebody who was going to come in and thump the Romans on their heads and move them out and set up a kingdom. And so they were really paying attention. So when Jesus was fulfilling these messianic prophecies, then... They were like saying, wow, this guy is something. But when he didn't do it quite like they wanted to, and then he, you know, allowed himself to be crucified, they were like, that possible, couldn't possibly be a Messiah because they were thinking of a Messiah differently because he was setting up a different kingdom, the one we talked about on Sunday, where we're offensively charging to promote, not uh, a Rome, something that's going to beat the Romans up, right? Are you with me? So something that, um, you know, about about Jesus is that all these miracles he did were a fulfillment of messianic prophecies. Um, Old Testament prophecies weren't random. Uh, when Jesus healed the blind man in John 9, he was filling a prophecy from Isaiah 35, 5, which foretold that the Messiah would open the eyes of the blind. Um, uh, it's not just the healings, even raising the dead. It was the fulfillment of Isaiah chapter 26, 19, where he spoke about the dead rising in the age of the Messiah. And so these miracles weren't isolated events. They were God's fingerprints confirming that Jesus wasn't just God. He was fulfilling the, the prophetic message that he was coming to make everything right, to fix a broken world. Everything had pr been prepared all the way from the day of Abraham. His first calling was setting the lineage and affecting everything to get Jesus to where he, he is. And you could even go further back. We could go all the way back to at Genesis when, when uh, the very first prophecy. But anyway, the feeding of the 5,000 is a miraculous echo of God's provision. Remember when he provided manna in the wilderness, right? It would be something that they would be, remember, how he can feed people and take care of people. And so by performing these miracles, Jesus showed that he had authority to provide beyond human capabilities, right? When they couldn't eat, he fed them. Miracles as fulfillment of the authentication of Jesus' claims. More than anything else, miracles authenticated Jesus' claims. So back then, it wasn't enough just to say, I, 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 and, I and the Father are one. You got to back that up. So when Jesus said he was the Son of God or the Messiah or one with the Father, he then had signs that proved it. So then they would have heard him. And then they went, what did he mean by that? Oh, my gosh, look what he's doing. <laughs> he just fed a bunch of people. Oh, look, he just raised somebody from the dead. So his teachings then were being solidified in the hearts of people when they were seeing the miracles. Are you getting it? So one of the best examples of this is in Mark chapter 2 when Jesus heals a paralytic. But before he performs the healing, he says, your sins are forgiven. Remember? That's the one we talked about earlier. So he makes this proclamation that only God could do. And then he does something that only God could do by healing him. Are you with me? So he's got the truth claim and then the action to back up the truth claim. And then they go, wow, he just said he's God. He just said that because look, look what he did. Are you getting it? And so these are important. So miracles as witnessed uh, public events. One of the most compelling things about Jesus' miracles, and I know some of these are kind of re repetitive, but I, I kind of put them out there so you can foot stomp them that these weren't done in private. It's very important for you to get that. All these miracles, whether over nature, life, and death, fulfilling prophecy, Jesus wasn't showing off his power. He was, he was a sign pointer. He did it publicly. He did it to reveal who he was, God in human form. He wielded authority that only God can have. His miracles were public signs. They validated his claims to divinity. And so they weren't just awe-inspiring. They were undeniable declarations. The actual miracles were, were visible declarations. That's what a sign is. It's visibly declaring it. Okay? And then we have the ultimate miracle, which is what? The resurrection, right? The resurrection isn't just one miracle among many miracles. It's the miracle. Because if Jesus died and didn't rise, yeah, it is a complete waste of time. It is a complete There is no Christianity if Jesus stayed dead, he would have been just added to all the misguided zealots who claimed to be Messiah along the way, which there were a lot in those days. 
Paul actually says, if Christ hasn't been raised from the dead, our, our faith is futile or pointless. But since he was raised, we know that everything he claimed, his divinity, his mission, was validated. So the resurrection is the foundation on which the entire Christian faith stands. And having said that, I'm going to cover very little compared to what you could study on the resurrection. There's some great stuff on the resurrection. And it's one that I always come back to. So whenever you want to talk about the difference between Jesus and any other figure of any religious organization, there is no other figure that claimed to be God and rose from the dead in any other faith. Okay? So use it. Wield the resurrection. Learn it. Learn good arguments for it. So that because it is the answer. And that's what I always do when I'm witnessing to people. When I get a chance, I'll say, you know, what do you think of Jesus? And I'm, they'll talk about it. And I'll say, yeah, well, you know, these, these recordings about him are that he didn't just die on a cross that we saw, you know, in the Passion. He actually came back to life. And many eyewitnesses saw him, over 500 eyewitnesses, which is a big deal. So you want to be able to have that. And so let's look at some of the key. We're just going to look at a few key evidences. Again, there are many we could do. The first one is the empty tomb. The Gospels tell us that women were the first to find the empty tomb. And I, this is a little bit of a re, uh, repeat from last week, but it's a good reinforcement. In a culture where women's testimony wasn't even considered valid in court, this is a significant detail. Why? Because if the disciples had been making up a story, they wouldn't have chosen women. They would have chosen the witnesses to be men. So what it does when they talk about the empty tomb, it points to the honesty of this account. They, they were simply reporting what happened. No one, neither the Jewish leaders nor the Roman authorities, ever produced a body to disprove it. That's important. When someone says, I don't believe the resurrection is true, or maybe someone hid the body or something, they certainly would have found it and showed it, showed it right? And the Romans certainly, I've heard our, actually arguments where people say, I think the Romans did. I'm like, that doesn't make any sense at all. So I, that one's a pretty easily dis, discreditable. But there are people who believe that. The reality of the empty tomb was undeniable, even among those who didn't believe in Jesus. They would say that definitely the tomb was empty. We went to the tomb. It wasn't the wrong tomb, <laughs> which is one of the arguments, right? But consider the practical difficulties of stealing Jesus' body. I love this. I've preached on this on a lot of Easter's. But I'm only going to foot stomp a few, but there's a ton of them. But the tomb was guarded by Roman soldiers. A, a garrison of soldiers would have been there, right? And these guys, if they would have fallen asleep on duty or, or just kind of let somebody come in and steal the most precious thing, that the reason they're there, they would have been facing execution. So this was not something they would have been doing half-heartedly, right? They would have been very serious about it because they had heard about this rabble rouser named Jesus who had this group of disciples and, and, he, they, and, and, and our Roman leadership and government just killed their leader and they're probably going to try to do something. They'd have been looking out. Are you with me? Okay, so that's important to go. So the tomb was guarded by Roman soldiers, highly trained men, trained men who have been ready to fight to death if necessary. Not only that, but the tomb was sealed with a large stone. That would not have been easy just to move out of the way. And by the women, wait, the women showed up to find it. They weren't moving that stone. And they weren't overpowering the, the Roman soldiers, right? Uh, up to two tons. They, that, that's some estimates. That's how big the stone was, right? And then it had a seal on it. And it was a Roman seal. And in those days, what a, what a Roman seal was is, is when they would take a wax and they would press the Roman signet into it, and it would basically say, if you break this seal, it's punishable unto death. So they, they put the stone in front of it and then sealed it to say, this is, this is untouchable, and then put a guards around it. Are you with me? This isn't just something, and I'm always amazed. Well, I, I'm jumping ahead again. I get excited. Even if someone had managed to do all this, oh, I, I'm actually, I'm going to tip my hand on this. How could Jesus, who had just been beaten, scourged, and crucified, show up a couple of days later looking like he's ready to, I mean, guys, if I, I, had, I had shoulder surgery, and I'd look like a, a you know, a, for, for a year, you know, let alone be crucified on a cross, and I'm walking around acting like I'm all victorious? No, 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 no. Scourging and thorn of crown of thorns and spear in my side and hands nailed and asphyxiation. I mean, no, he's not getting up. And if they 
manage to, oh, anyway, let's go. We'll talk about that because it's, it's one of the crazy things that people will say. I and mean, I would go there. But, okay, so the, em, the tomb was empty. There's no doubt about it. Because otherwise, if it wasn't, guess what would have happened? The Romans would have said, ha, 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 here he is. There were multiple appearance, appearances of Jesus after his resurrection. Jesus appeared to the disciples many times and in different settings. First, First Corinthians tells us over 500 people witnessed him. Some of these people were still alive when Paul was writing, so anyone could have asked them about them. And he even says that. They weren't hallucinations. This is another, or this is another argument against this. They were all hallucinations. You cannot have a mass hallucination in multiple places. It could, I guess you could, but it's super improbable. And then when you stack it with the evidence of the empty tomb and you start adding these things up, you go, this is that. Ah, I don't quite believe that, right? Um, these appearances were physical and tangible, giving his disciples no doubt. Now, there's a whole bunch you can do. You can actually take time and look at each of the appearances, but we don't have time tonight because I looked at the clock and it's 10 after. Then there is the transformation of the disciples. Before the resurrection, the disciples were scaredy cats, terrified, scattered. When Jesus was arrested, they were hiding in fear during his crucifixion. But after seeing the risen Jesus, they become bold, willing to be beaten, willing to be in prison, even killed for their belief. They didn't just have some new sense of mission. They had encountered something that instilled in them a desire to go. And if he can beat death, we can beat death. Right? There's more than just this death, this world. Super huge, right? Yeah, to go from, and you're not going to go and then preach about his resurrection unto death if he hadn't. There's nothing to be gained from it. They lost family members. They were beaten. This wasn't a 21st century television evangelist who's passing out, you know, a bucket for people's money. They weren't doing that. They were living on the streets and homeless and scourged and beaten. And I mean, you read Paul's exploits, right? Let's move on. One of the big ones, Paul's. And there's Paul. He was a fierce opponent of Christianity, hunting down believers. But after encountering the risen Jesus on the road to Damascus, Paul's life was completely turned upside down. It's a good one to talk about. A lot of people, when you're witnessing to somebody, don't know the story of Paul. So use him. Um, he went from persecuting Christians to becoming one of the faith's most passionate advocates. Paul wasn't seeking Jesus, and yet he had an encounter so powerful he couldn't deny it on his way to kill Christians. Also, another one is James. James is the brother of Jesus. He's not the blood brother, but he is a brother because Mary had more children, by the way, right? And so James is one of them. And James initially thought Jesus was crazy. But after the resurrection, he becomes the leader of the Jerusalem council. He becomes a leader of the church. That's a powerful testimony. You don't go from thinking your brother's crazy and misguided to all of a sudden touting him as a resurrected savior unless you saw something. That's a good one, right? The early preaching of the resurrection. From the very start, the apostles preached that Jesus had risen from the dead. In Acts chapter 2, Peter stands up at Pentecost just weeks after the crucifixion, and he boldly proclaims to a crowd in Jerusalem that Jesus raised, was raised from the dead. Now keep in mind, this is the same city where Jesus was crucified. The same soldiers that crucified Jesus. The same garrison hanging out. The same leaders. This is just not long. This, is, this isn't years later. It's weeks later. Okay? And he's out there preaching. That's a boldness and a fervency that says something instilled in them the ability to say, this thing is real. And we know that all the apostles were martyred. Crucified upside down, boiled in oil. Some people don't think John was. Um, I, I took the Gospel of John, and I have a professor who feels like the, the guy who wrote the, the book of Revelation might have been another guy named John the Elder, which is interesting. Uh, and there's, you can debate it and look it up yourself. It doesn't matter either way because he got exiled and he died there, right? But at any rate, they were all, they all went through it, right? Boiled in oil, crucified, heads chopped off, all kinds of things. Um, and the message spread quickly, and thousands believed. The fact that the resurrection was preached so early and so publicly is powerful evidence that it wasn't just a story. The early preaching tells that it's real, and it spread like wildfire. 
And, and then the power of the Spirit on top of that. I mean, just the testimonies, right? And so testimony is very important to the early church. We're going to give you some common objections, and we're going to close this. Common objections to the resurrection and rebuttals. The first one is the stolen body theory. Some say the disciples stole Jesus' body and made the resurrection story up. But the, the argument is, give them the argument of the Roman soldiers and all the things that we mentioned, okay? Um, they, would, they would have gained nothing by being bought off. They would have lost their lives <laughs> to let somebody steal the body, right? And again, you always want to say this. People don't die for something that they know is false. I guess you could come up with some ex extreme idea of some crazy person, but not mass amounts of people, right? Because it didn't just end with the apostles. People were being martyred. I mean, it was so bad in Rome under Nero. They literally, and this, I don't want to get graphic here, but they would take people and dip them in candle wax and light them on fire to light the city with the people. I mean, it was bad. They had the Colosseums bad. I've been to, I've been to Italy. The Colosseum went on for 400 years. Man, lots of people died in that thing, right? Um, and so, so yeah, that, that argument about the stolen body, it's pretty easy. There's another one called the swoon theory. That's the one I laugh at because that's the one you can say, yeah, let's say he did swoon. Then, you know, then begin to try to explain to me how he could look so victorious after all the things he went through. And if someone does kind of come up with that, because I've had people bring that up to me, well, maybe he didn't really die. Uh, well, let's say he didn't. You know, and then just go through the things, go through each step. The, just the scourging at the pillars with 40, 39 lashes. I mean, it's like hamburger coming off your back. They did that to avoid crucifixion because most people died at the scourging and never even had to go to the cross. I mean, they died after getting, because it had that, that uh, cat of nine tails had leather, uh, leather straps on it that had pieces of glass and bone and, and lead, uh, lead uh, balls on it. And it, when it hit, it grabbed into his back and they'd yank it out. And it was, they were yanking flesh off that guy, you know? That by itself, let alone the, everything else and the crown of thorns. And, and just think that this guy's swooned. No, come on. <laughs> just. Then you got wrong tomb. <laughs> That's another good one. Wrong tomb, different person theory. I've heard that one. If it was the wrong tomb, trust me, the Romans would have said, okay, <laughs> we got to put this thing to bed. <laughs> Bring it out. Show them the real tomb, right? I don't even know. People come up with crazy, crazy objections. Then there's the legendary development theory. Some people suggest that the resurrection story was a legend that developed over time and that Jesus' followers didn't originally believe he had physically risen from the dead. It would have been discarded by everyone when it was when the gospels were written because the eyewitnesses would have still been alive. It go back to the story about that Native American Martin Luther King who was killed by sharks off the coast of Florida. You can't publish that book because everyone knows Martin Luther King's not Native American. He wasn't killed by sharks. You just use some make up your own story, you know. But whatever it is, um, you know, just it's not a legendary development story. This theory ignores the fact that the resurrection was preached from the very, very beginning. The earliest creed in, in 1 Corinthians uh, chapter 15 dates back to just a few years, maybe even weeks after Jesus. And then the last one is the hallucination theory. I touched on that too. Others claim that Jesus' post-resurrection appearances were hallucinations. Hallucinations are individual subjective experiences. They cannot be shared by that many people. Yet Jesus' appearance over 500 people at one time and then all the other times, the road to uh, Emmaus Road, right? The, the, you know, I mean, the disciples who are in a room, I mean, he's showing up the, 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 uh, on the shore with Peter when he restores Peter and he's making fish. And he wasn't just a, there's another, I don't have time to go into it, but there's another theory that he was a ghost. <laughs> you know, he was just a spirit. Maybe they were just, uh, but the ghost ate fish. And Thomas touched him. And, you know, so you seeing that there's plausible arguments against this stuff. And so it, hopefully you picked up a few today. You'll have the notes. You can look over them. Uh, there they are. And so we've got to land the plane. It's 20 after. <laughs>